how wonderful it is to be here today. I love this place. This place is my spiritual home and will always be my spiritual home. And what a journey it has been coming to this place. One of the uh, things that I like about this center, this is probably very ego-based, but I don't care, is a lot of people call this center the Prosperity Center in Asheville. Okay, I accept. That sounds like a good idea. And, and I think that's because every summer we do this thing called, called a prosperity class. And I've done my best over the years to, to kind of mix it up and do different things. And I'm going to do that this year too. We're going to do it differently than we've done before. And My purpose today is to convince you to come to as many of these classes as you can. Not because you need to, but because there's something there for you. And it's my intention to make sure there is something there in that class for all of us, including me. So on this, uh, this journey of awakening into a prosperous life, uh, I believe that, uh, that this class has helped me tremendously. And I, I want to start my thought as we move through this with a Holmes quote. Holmes quote that uh, has always been very powerful for me. And then I'm going to do a little dissecting. Here's the quote. Nothing is real to us unless we make it real. Nothing can touch us until we let it touch us. Refuse to have the feelings hurt. Refuse to receive anyone's condemnation. In the independence of your own mentality, believe and feel you're wonderful. This is not conceit. It is the truth. What can be more wonderful than the manifestation of infinite mind? Brilliant quote. Powerful quote. And within that quote is a line that is absolutely my favorite quote from Holmes. Nothing is real to us unless we make it real. Nothing is real to us unless we make it real. Consider what that might mean. The, the other larger, longer quote really was about Holmes talking about how don't put yourself down. Don't believe people that criticize you. See yourself for who you are in the divine understanding of the universe. Fantastic. This line makes everything possible. It's the most powerful thing I think that Holmes has said to us, to me anyway. Nothing is real to us until we make it real. Unless we make it real. So what does that mean? How do, we, how do we find the deep meaning of that idea? Well, we look at our lives. And we look at our lives which start at a point where we don't have language. We take a breath. Now that's not our life, that's our body. Because I believe we're infinite, infinite beings. And that somehow in the mechanism of uh, the, the wholeness of all that is, there's some way that we set down our knowing of life and we start a bodily experience without having the benefit of all that. But the interesting thing I've always noticed about newborns is they have incredible personality. And they do not have the same personality as their siblings. So it's not in the DNA. People come in as beings, as spiritual beings on, on planet Earth. And before you've got language, you start applying meaning. Probably the first thing that you actually apply meaning to is, food is good. <laughs> now, you don't have those words to say, but there's something wonderful about suckling, about taking in nourishment, about how that makes the body feel so wonderful and full and happy. Yay! I mean, that's where we start. But we don't stop there. Eventually, we start learning language. We start putting things in terms of, of thoughts, thoughts that are, that are language-based is what I'm saying. But we continue to just receive data and information that flows to us that we see happening in the world, our experiences, and we make a choice. And mostly when we're at that age and we're developing our awareness of the physical universe, again, maybe, we're in a place where we accept pretty much all of it. We accept what our parents tell us is so. We accept what we see our siblings doing as being real. 
And the whole thing is taking on all of this information and saying, that's the way the universe works. That's the way life works. That's the way my life is because that's what I'm seeing and experiencing. We're making it real. Does that mean it's the best thing to do? Not necessarily. It's very possible that we see uh, our, our, sist- our brother, let's do it this way, our brother kick our sister or kick the dog. And we go, hmm, that's interesting. And we take that on as being real. It's something I can do too. And then we're stuck with that until we figure out that that actually creates more pain in our lives because we've taken that thing on and seeing it as real. So we get stuck in this game of, of thinking everything is real until we can finally get to a point where we, we stop and start saying, well, maybe I shouldn't do that or maybe that's not going to work out for me or maybe there's a better way. And we start looking at things a little differently. Someone that taught me how to do that, <laughs> when I was, how old was I? I was probably in my 50s, maybe late 40s. There was someone who came into my life, Will Rocking Bear, my Native American teacher. And when he would talk to someone and they would say something that did not resonate with his understanding of the world, he would say, that's not true for me. I watched him do that over and over and over again. And I thought, what an elegant way. He didn't say, you're wrong. He didn't say, you, you don't understand what's going on here. He didn't lecture or any of that stuff to people. He would just say, that's not true for me. And he made his point so well. And then that other person was a choice. They could, they could look again at what they said or they could just dismiss it and keep doing what they wanted. And frankly, he didn't care. What a clean way to play your life. We are constantly had a choice of making things real or not real in our lives. Making things part of the fabric of who we are and how we live our lives. That's the whole, this whole human experience is to do that. If any of you have studied quantum mechanics, you, under, you, you, you know about the experiment done 50 or more years ago, probably more than that, where, where they would uh, study light and they had this mechanism that would identify light as either particles or waves. And they, they had this way that they could actually record what was, what was being recorded as the light going into this, this instrument, this, this box. And what they figured out was, is that whether it was particles or waves, the determining factor was not the light, it was the observer. It was the observer that was saying whether it would be one or the other based on what they were looking for. Now, that's rudimentary, but think of the implications of that. That's what metaphysics is based on because we make things real because we say we're real. And then it keeps showing up again and again and again in our lives the way we've made it real. And we get stuck in this thing of thinking somehow that the bad things in our lives are real. But what has happened is that we have chosen to accept those things that we don't like, that we don't want, we claim we don't want. We claim as, we see them as real. And if once they're real, they start really dumping on us and making our lives sometimes very unmanageable. Nothing is real to any of us until we make it real. Nothing can touch us until we let it touch us. We're always at choice about this. And it makes all the difference to understand that. My my, uh, first spiritual teacher, Ken Dyer, taught me that we are constantly at what he called choice point. We get to choose with every experience what to receive as being so. And at the same time, we can do like Rocking Bear. He didn't know this. I hadn't met Rocking Bear yet. But he told me that we could let it, we could let it go and say, no, that's, that's not for me. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to accept that. And that's what this idea of prosperity is. I watch people come year after year to the prosperity class. And they sit there and they want to do 
the affirmations and they want somebody to treat for them and they want all of the good in their lives to come. But they tend not to, some of them, tend not, not you, they tend not to be willing to look at what they've made real in their life. The stuff that they've made real that doesn't serve them. So they do all this work, this work, to let go of the, of the, the stuff that, that they don't like, but they don't really know how to do it because they've made it real and they still believe it's real. But the truth is that nothing's real until you make it real. Nothing, nothing until you make it real. And, you know, someone would argue with me, especially sensates, uh, most of you are intuitives, but we have some sensates among, among us who say, no, you can see it, you can touch it, you can measure it, you can weigh it, you can hear it. It's real. Only if you make it real. I remember times where I would be counseling someone and I would have this enlightened thought about what was going on in their life. It was so clear to me. And I would say those words to them that came through me to say, this is what's going on. And they would be deer in the headlights. Nobody's home because they don't want to hear it. That didn't match their sense of reality. So they just wouldn't even entertain that as a possibility. Others would hear it and go, oh, no, you know, and try to fight me on it. And once in a while, somebody go, I'm going to really think about that. However you want to do it, you get to do it your way. Nobody can make you do anything. It's all up to you. And it's at that choice point that you get to decide, decide what is real in your life. So we're talking about prosperity. And I think we need to divine prosperity. So to do that, I wanted to go to the ultimate definer of prosperity. Her name is Edwin Gaines. I think most of you probably heard of Edwin. That's Edwin in full form, on stage, talking truth. She had four elements to prosperity that she said existed. And I've shortened them so that I could get them on the screen. But we're going to look at them very quickly, one at a time. A vitally alive body is prosperous. Now you would go, well, then I guess that means Barbara's not prosperous. No, Barbara's still very vital. She doesn't have the full use of her body like she used to, but her body is still vital. Her heart pumps perfectly and, and spreads uh, the nutrition that she, that she ingests into her body. And she has, she's, a, at that level, a full-functioning individual. Her mind is so clear. Her hearing is freakishly good. <laughs> Just saying, she'll say to me, you hear that? Do I hear what? There's a faucet running. So I go through the house, and sure enough, there's a faucet that has this tiny little drip. And she can hear it. Freaks me out sometimes. But she can do it. So don't ever see anyone in life as, as not having a vitally alive body. And work on yourself to know what your vitally alive body looks like. The second one is satisfying relationships. God knows that's a big one in, in living a prosperous life. You don't want to surround yourself with critics, with people that see you less than whole. People who don't know the brilliant, beautiful, amazing being of love and light that you are. Surround yourself with those people. Let those people influence you and touch you. And on the matter of, of uh, being prosperous, surround yourself with prosperous people. I invite you, if you have anyone in your life that's living a very limited, uh, closed-down life, wish them well and let them go. They're not serving you. Don't be mean. Be loving. But you don't have to spend your time with someone who is trying to pull you down to their level of despair. Surround yourself with people that come here and places like this so that you can be who you are meant to be. And the best way to do that is to be lifted up as you lift those around you up. Work that we love. Edwin used to say, if you want to have a million dollars, provide a million dollars worth of service to the world. But the most important part of it is pick something you love to do. 
if there's anyone here that's getting up in the morning and cursing your job, you might want to really consider doing something else. Now, the reason you wouldn't do something else is because you don't know what that would be. But if you're not looking for the thing that will serve you the best in life, you'll never find it. And if you're spending your time hating your job, (coughs) you're denying yourself the opportunity to love it. Sometimes it's just an attitude adjustment that changes a crummy job into a wonderful job, into an experience that you you get up and go to with delight. The litmus test, of course, is would you do what, what you're doing if you weren't getting paid? Would you still get up and do it because you love it so much? Well, I've been doing this work for a long time, and I've never not wanted to be here to do this to be with you, to touch your lives and have you touch my life. It's a brilliant thing to get to do. And I would do it even if I wasn't getting paid. I'm not talking to our board members. (coughs) And then, of course, the last piece of the puzzle is all the money we can spend. Woohoo, money. Yes, money is part of the puzzle, but it's not the whole thing. There's more to do. And I know plenty of people who have lots of money they're not prosperous because those other three things just don't work. They put all their attention on the money part and they miss the point of it. That living a meaningful life is what's, what it's all about. And yes, money's a piece of that. I don't think any of us came to this and Edwin would, would uh, uh, back me up on this. <coughs> that, that money comes as a byproduct of living an abundant life. It isn't that you set your attention on on making a certain amount of money or having a certain amount of money. I've always told people in class, don't do that thing where your treatment, that your your inner work is about having a certain amount of money. That's not it. There's something bigger going on. And to demonstrate that, in that I think it's now time, even though this doesn't really fit into my my uh, way of doing things. Uh, I'm going to talk about Barbara's and my experience with money. We've been teaching prosperity for a long time. And I love that this is called the Prosperity Center. And that people come here with that idea that they're going to live a more prosperous life. So this money thing. I grew up in a, uh, a working class family. My dad actually... Uh, left school in the 10th grade. So did my mom. She was a housewife. Uh, He serviced jukeboxes for a living. And the owner of the jukebox company was my godfather. He's the one that had money. But we didn't have much money. My mom was, was, uh, had a budget of $60 a week to feed six of us. And she made it work somehow. I don't know how she did. But We grew up, you know, we didn't really ever need anything. It wasn't, oh, you know, I I went through the phases. Uh, Anybody who's around my age might remember that there were certain pieces of clothing that were so popular in school that if you didn't have one, you were just lost. Like a a, uh, London Fog jacket or I I forget what the shirts were called. But, you know, we had these brands and... Uh, my parents didn't want to hear about brands. Your clothes are clean and, and, and ironed. Shut up, put them on, and go to school. <laughs> and then on Christmas morning, one of those things would be under the tree. We, we managed, but we didn't ever have money. There, were no, there was no great savings. My dad did something called playing the numbers, which I still to this day don't understand. But uh, he, he, there were a couple times where he actually won some kind of a jackpot. And they would, they would cha- do something with the house. They would put in new carpeting or something with that money, which I thought was, was brilliant. But uh, I didn't understand this idea of, of high levels of prosperity. And that was okay. But I carried that into my adult life. Uh, I never got any training on how to manage money. When I uh, uh, was, I think, 19, I moved to Texas, <clears throat> and I got a job with a big corporation, first big job. I had worked in a Sears warehouse, but this was the big job, uh, working for a, a major manufacturer in, in Houston. 
And uh, I, was, I got married when I was 20. And uh, um, I learned that business. And at some point, I went off and started my own business that was related to that, using the information I'd learned working for the big company. <clears throat> and did quite well. I was in business for four years, the last year that we were in business. Uh, I think I, I, we got, had about $4 million in sales. And I was bringing in, raking in a ton of money. But I had no prosperity consciousness. So the money would go as fast as it went in. I rem- we, we bought a nice big house in a ritzy neighborhood in North Houston. And there were times where I had to race a check and tape it onto the, uh, the electric meter, the, the, the meter in the backyard or the back of the house, uh, so that they wouldn't turn the lights off. Terrible money manager. And pretty much destroyed that business over, even though the economy did it too, the industry we were in did it, but if it hadn't have done it, I would have destroyed it. So I didn't really have a sense of that. I knew how to make money, but I didn't know how to keep it. I didn't know how to use it. So I still had a lot to learn. And when my wife and I separated, <clears throat> and I was lost puppy, I went all the way to the other side of the planet to Australia and met my first spiritual teacher, which started making things shift. Not enough that I had a lot of money, but I, I had enough money. Money. When I left Australia a year later uh, and went back to my hometown of Miami, uh, I walked into my first Science of Mind Center. And the woman that came out from the back uh, told me what the place was. My question was, what is Science of Mind? Because that's what the sign said outside. And I don't remember what she said, but she invited me to come. And I was immediately addicted because they were telling me I could have a full, rich life. I'm in. I want to do that. I want to have it. And the one that was teaching me that, her name was Barbara. And it really worked for me. Now, that was in, that was in 1984. <clears throat> in 1988... I I left that church. Uh, Barbara and I got married in 89. And we pretty quickly, the next year in 1990, moved to Asheville because we just didn't want to live in the environment that Miami was at the time. So we came up here. And we moved near my uncle's farm. I had an uncle named Forrest Merrill who had an 80-acre uh, dairy farm that he had run since I was, at least since I was a kid. I remember when I was 16, my mom brought us and my siblings up here and we, we were on the farm and I tasted my first raw milk. So he had run that farm for decades. And one day, Uncle Forrest and I were just having one of those little conversations on the front porch. And he said, so how much money you got? And I would normally not say, t- want to have that conversation with anybody. But I said, Barbara and I, have about $10,000 cash. And he chuckled and said, I've got about 150,000. And I thought, well, good for you. You've been doing this work for all these years. You should have something. But that that was important to him. And it was a a point in me that said, I can have those kind of numbers too. So when it came time after he passed, we were living on his farm by then, we started our center and Barbara really wanted to do this thing a summer class on prosperity. She'd been the one that reminded me from my youth the value of tithing. We were by then well into tithing. And we were were being more prosperous. But there was still more to do. So we started these summer classes and we we did them. And we've been doing them for 27 years. And it's been wonderful and I've enjoyed every single minute of it. I've enjoyed every single minute of of teaching this. But one thing that I had avoided doing for all these years was determining our net worth. Just never wanted, I guess I didn't want to, because I never did. I remember even in one class I encouraged people to do that, but I didn't do it. (laughs) So a couple of months when I was playing with the idea of doing this as probably my last class at this center, I said, John, just do it. Go ahead. Add up your property, your value of your cars, your your investments, uh, uh, any other assets that you have. Add it all up. And I did. 
Barbara and I have a net worth of right around a million dollars? I had no idea. It, it, was, it was stunning to me. And I'm not telling you this to brag. I'm really not. And it didn't come from any windfall profits or inheritances or, trust me, being a science mind minister is not in, in and of itself uh, uh, on salary a way to become wealthy. It's not. But we, we continue to teach these principles and live them and what has occurred from that is that we have done that thing that so many people say they want. Oh, and a million dollars. Wow. Now, I also want you to know that there are people in this room that have a net worth of much, much more than that. And here's the kicker. Most of them will be in the prosperity class. Not because they're looking to have more. They'll come to the class because they're interested in the concept and they enjoy that process. And they've used it in their lives or they wouldn't be where they are. So we're gonna do this summer class. We're gonna look at this idea and we're gonna allow ourselves to get out of our own way and be prosperous. Because this is what we're here to do, is to live in the abundance of the divine, to know who we are, not to feign away from it, to live that full, rich, meaningful life that is ours to live, to be who we've come here to be. And that is not to be a pauper. It, it is not to be lost. It is not to be alone. We're here to support the magnificence of the divine, the creative force of the universe as us. And by doing so, we all prosper. I hope you'll join me a week from tomorrow. I love you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.